tutorial starts with a song, but it's only a few seconds long. Let's get started with animation. Hi there, Bifrost Craft has been introduced in uh, the at the end of 2019. We're at the beginning of 2020. It's a very powerful module which you find here under Windows. Oh, it's not here. Why is it not here? Because you need to go to Settings Preferences, the Plugin Manager, then type in BIF, for example, not DIF, BIF, and that leads you to the Bifrost nodes here and you can load them into Maya now and if you want to start up Maya next time you check the auto load you need all these th uh, four modules I guess uh, maybe yeah you do and uh, it takes a while until they're loaded into Maya it's finished now now you see they're here one of the modules here the examples here namely the cloth you find it in the Bifrost scrap browser windows bifrost browser you have fire smoke different examples and uh, i found the cloth interesting because it's so easy to uh, create cloth with this module you go to fx and you create cloth right here create cloth you need a geometry and then you create cloth and that's uh, it then so this is much more complex, uh, not in terms of this dynamic simulation, but in terms of how to how does this work. The cloth here is easy and this is complex. And I'll show you a little bit about the complexity and to try to understand what it really does. So I double click it or single click it and import it. And then I get this node section here. Uh, I need to see more of these nodes and you see I cannot move the window now. I'm trying to drag it down here, but it takes time for my to evaluate the connection. Now it's done, so be patient with it. And um, now I move this over here and extend this quite a bit. And now I press the key L for layout, so I get a bigger view of the thing. We'll come back to this window soon, and I just want to show you how slow this simulation goes. So this is what we see here in the viewport and something is happening you see the real time of my computer which is a computer maybe four or five years old and um, with a good graphics card which doesn't play a role here I guess so we have a piece of cloth we have two sticks here polygon cubes I would uh, expect suspect and nothing is tearing although it's called a tearing cloth example so we're at frame 31 now what is happening here this part here this cube scales down and up and down again now it's very uh, slim here does that influence the tearing process now it's getting wider and uh, while we're watching this you won't find any keyframes here so the movement of this, the scaling of uh, this part here, is done in the Bifrost graph as well. And I'll show you where it is because I already found it. Now we're approaching frame 70. And because I've seen this before, at frame 80, the tearing process will start. And for the tearing process, I'll stop at about frame 85. Now the tearing start, starts here and there. And now I stop the simulation and I get a little bit closer because I think things are kind of strange here. We have this line here. Why is that line here and what is it for? Does it render? Let's introduce a light and render it. This takes longer than a typical cloth rendering. I guess because we need to deal with the Bifrost graph which is a little bit slow. My first attempt to render this made my crash. It just crashed. No error message, nothing. It just disappeared. And it disappears again. So this is definitely a bug here. 
Well, then, no rendering today. I think this shows us in what kind of experimental phase we currently are with this plugin. And I actually appreciated that uh, the folks who programmed the programming language called Bifrost Graph uh, actually um, released it without documentation or anything. We just need to try out things. I'm currently at frame 93, so the tearing should stop just soon. Yes, it does. I, I see this part of the uh, of the cloth right here I don't know why that is and why that should be and now it does that floating down process it really looks nice it looks exactly like what we know from the end cloth now let's have a look at the bifrost graph it's actually not that complicated you have an input called time that's interesting because usually we start with geometry and you have an output here and one more output here this is the cloth output as you can see and this is the output for a static cube constraint it's called and an animated cube constraint when we go back here and we see that there are connections here and one is the create mesh cube number one with dimensions etc and you can set the dimensions here in the properties part of this window here on the right hand side so these are the dimensions and uh, when you change anything here in the parameters for example the length instead of 10 or when you change it to 5 and press enter or go to the next tab it takes a while until the bifrost graph digests that new information and uh, it's still not finished yet it's still calculating now it's done so I can hover the mouse over here if you want to change things in the Bifrost graph without having to wait you need to deconnect these things or stop the simulation which is somewhere up here uh, but it usually every little change here makes Maya very slow and you have to be patient and wait so this is the first cube this is the small one and we actually see how small it is and the, the cloth disappears because uh, Maya needs to think about the whole scene uh, new now so here is the small one it does not affect the size of the cloth But it seems to affect the dynamics of the cloth because it uh, respects that new size here the way it sinks down so this is just a miniature change here this is the static cube here down here we have the second mesh cube that's the dynamic one and it um, it is being fed right here into the output number one and uh, as opposed to this one it gets two informations here and one is the time and one is the evaluate F curve now the ev evaluate F curve is something which I don't understand really uh, why it's an F curve and uh, if you plug a, a curve into this input here this blue input it doesn't work uh, so I don't know what it's good for this is a brief excerpt when you click here you see the evaluate F curve node info here and here you can change this curve and the curve basically means how long in our case because it's X how long the cube is over time and this basically over time this value here for example is position 131 and the value is 30 so uh, this is frame 131 so you can change this to whatever and make the animation much longer it's a very peculiar way to animate the scaling of a cube but now let's go back to where we came from at time 26 it's frame 26 so the number 26 goes into the X channel of this evaluate F curve load so we have 26 here now and it goes into the Y output of the evaluate node and into the length of our mesh cube so if we change this for example and uh, 
put this into the width, for example, rather than the length, uh, or we could make a new connection over here as well as this one, uh, it would change the whole ge geometry of the mesh cube. It would animate the mesh cube over time. So the time is putting information into the evaluate F curve node and this hands it over to the create mesh cube dimensions in terms of length in this case. That's why this cube changes its length all the time over the animation. So this is the first part here and I move it a little bit up. We have a connection here which is interesting and we should talk about this. Both create mesh cube nodes deliver their information to the output and as well to the constrain cloth node. It's a constrain cloth node meaning that the cloth will be constrained here and uh, it is the cube mesh one and the uh, out geometry from the other cube which land in this node here. Other than that we have a cloth source in the constraint cloth. So the constraints work with the two cubes and the cloth object. That's why we have the cloth object coming in here. Make MPM cloth, that's what it's called. Create mesh plane, and that's the plane where the cloth is being made from. Like in N cloth, it's a typical thing you need a geometry in order to create cloth, cloth from it. So you start with a mesh plane or a cube or whatever and uh, then you make M, uh, use the M make MPM cloth node and you plug it into a constraint cloth. If you don't have any constraints you can skip this node and then it comes to the simulate MPM node which is one of the key nodes here which uh, are active. They, this one drives the simulation. This is all uh, only about the constraint that means the cloth uh, is connected to the cubes. And here you have the solver settings because interestingly uh, the simulate MPM has nothing here to do. We cannot change anything here but we can right here. So um, for example, we have a detail size here in the solver settings, which is 0 0.1. We can change this to 0 0.5. That means we have much less detail, and that will make the simulation much faster, but less detailed. So 0 0.5, enter, and now we need to wait again until the Bifrost graph is being updated. And now let's have a look at the simulation. It goes much faster now and for trying out things this is probably a much better value and when you when it comes to rendering haha um, you can change the resolution of the simulation back to 0 0.1 now comes the ripping process and you see it goes much faster which is quite nice to see now let's extend the frame range here to 200 and let's see how it continues. It slowly falls down and this cube is always expanding and contracting according to the time and F-curve nodes. So what we just did was change the MPM solver settings, the detail size. We have gravity here and uh, th this node is basically the key node for the simulation. Here we have an output from the simulation node to the update mesh normals. I don't know what this is for and I can't see any documentation right here. And um, down here we have an AI standard surface shader which is basically the Arnold standard surface shader which feeds its information into an assigned material node. That's why we see that violet colored cloth object and then it goes to the output. If we wouldn't have the assigned material and stand surface uh, the simulation would be okay and we would see things but it would be just gray the default. Now um, 
I wonder why, whatever I change about the simulation, why it always gets teared off at frame 80. And I asked that question in the Maya area forum, Bifrost Graph, the tearing cloth example. I wrote in the Bifrost Graph browser, there's a tearing cloth node. I've started analyzing it and don't understand several things, one of which is, why does the tearing process start at frame 80? It does this even if I change the viscosity and gravity or other simulation parameters. Where is that number 80 hidden? Additional question, when I introduce one more piece of geometry, a polygon sphere for example in the scene, and feed its mesh output into the collider input of the simulate MPM node, there's a collider input I'll show you. This is the collider input here. So I created a new geometry and I fed it its mesh right in here. And my question was, why doesn't it do a thing? So two questions actually, and I got an answer from MJCJ91. <laughs> One, cloth tearing is based on failure stretch. You can find this parameter on make MPM cloth. Let's go search for it. We need to open the make MPM cloth node and search for failure stretch. Here is make MPM cloth. And where is failure stretch? It's down here. Failure. Failure post process, what it should do after tearing off. No failure, no post processing, delete failed triangles. Maybe I should do that. But um, what is the interesting value here it has nothing to do with 80. It's the number three. So let's try the number two then. Again, we have to wait. Now it's done. Now we redo our simulation. So we change that tearing value from 3 to 2. Oh, it tears off here. That's interesting. Very early. And now it tears off here uh, much earlier as well. So the number two has to do with when it's elastic enough or stretched enough to tear off. The lower the value, the earlier the tearing off process starts. Now how about one? We start again. And it doesn't seem to be constrained at all to either ones of the cubes. Now we change this to 6. It was 3 as you might remember. And you can expect what's happening now. The swimming pro process has been triggered by the change of this size here. Now we're approaching frame 100. It still hasn't been torn off. But now it does frame 110 from this side and probably much later from the other side. It's a dynamic simulation so we actually don't know what's happening. We have to try it out. Interestingly it doesn't tear off here now. Not completely, just a little bit. I'm speeding this up now so it looks more cool. We cannot cache it because here we have an exclamation mark meaning, uh, and you can check this out here in the the script editor, you can check out that uh, the Bifrost Graph simulation is not being supported here. So folks, we're learning and what I would suggest you to do now is this. Introduce a new geometry here. For example, a polygon sphere. Middle mouse drag it into that scene so it's right here. Now what I asked in my second question was can I why doesn't anything happen when I connect the mesh output 
to the collider's input of the simulate MPM. Information given here is you can't feed the geometry directly into the collider's input of the solver. You should first feed it into a collider node and then feed that into the solver's collider's input. This is needed in order to tag the geometry as collider object and also set the collision parameters. Maxime Jean Mougin, very nice. Thank you very much. We're in a learning phase here and I hope I didn't bore you too much. I spent quite some time with this graph here and um, I don't understand most of the things. Bye-bye.